the occlusion. Okay, so on, on the other hand as well, if we have occlusal problems, we can get problems with the periodontium. So this is why you'll see patients, so say a patient's got an anterior crossbite, a single tooth is out of, out of the bite. What can happen then is that if a single tooth has a high occlusal load, we can then get a localized periodontal defect. So these kind of patients will have a single tooth that's out at the front, so like an upper, a lower one that's getting traumatically occluded to the upper teeth. And this is why we get a localized recession around this. So just something to take away that it's all interconnected. And if you have problems with the teeth, the periodontium or the occlusion, you'll get problems elsewhere within another one of them. Okay. So terminology, this is one of the more heavier slides we'll see, but we'll go through it in more detail, okay? So there's terms which are centric terms. People either discuss occlusion in centric terms or terms like ICP or RCP. So just for the basis of it, if we start to learn centric terms, reading papers uh, will become a lot more easier for you to understand the occlusion. Okay, so first of all, we've got centric occlusion, which is CO. So this is the same as ICP. So it's the point that the, of maximum crispation of the teeth, and this is centric occlusion. We have something called centric relation, which I'm going to go on to a lot more in detail in a bit. And this is um, a reproducible position, which is not a tooth position, but it's where the muscles of mastication are at the most relaxed and where the mandibular condyles are in the most superior anterior portion of the glenoid fossa. You've got something called CRCP, and this is because centric relation is not a tooth position, we cannot say that CR is equal to retruded contact position. Retruded contact position, RCP, is the first point of contact in, at the back of the mouth when the muscles are in the most relaxed. So in reality, there needs to be a point called CRCP, which is the first tooth contact in centric relation but you can kind of ignore that because we don't really need to be looking into that. That's just there for just completeness. We have something called freedom in centric occlusion. So when we're in centric occlusion, maximum cuspation, we're not locked in. So you can all try this now. If you bite together in your normal bite and then move your teeth backwards and forwards very slightly, there should be a little bit of play, a, bit, a little bit of room where you can move your actual teeth and you can move backwards and forwards. And this means that you have something called freedom and centric occlusion. There might be a small proportion of you watching that can't do this. Um, and that's because a lot of people who are class two dip two, so which is 10% of the population are class two, um, will not be able to do this due to having a locked in occlusion. So this is something we need to be aware of, which I'll go into in the future. We have static occlusion, which we've gone through, which is your static contacts in centric occlusion. Your dynamic occlusion, as said before, the contacts during lateral excursive movements and protrusive movements. Okay, and then we've got working side and non-working side. So your working side, if your mandible moves to the right, your working side is the right. If your mandible moves to the left, your working side is the left, okay? So what this means is that if you move to the right and your jaw, there is a contact, an occlusal contact on the right, that is a working side interference. Okay, whereas with non working side, if you move your jaw to the right and there is a contact on the opposing side on the left, this is a non working side interference. And we'll go into non working side interferences in a bit more detail later. These interferences are the ones we need to be more aware of. Patients can have non working side interferences and tolerate them perfectly. However, we don't want to be introducing non working side interferences because there's evidence that states the introduction of non-working side interferences can actually cause problems with TMJ dysfunction. Finally, anterior and posterior guidance. Your anterior guidance is probably a term you've heard a lot. Most people think anterior guidance is anterior teeth. Realistically, it's not. That's just a simplified term because anterior guidance is any tooth guidance that is anterior to the TMJ joint. So when you protrude forward, you might have a contact on the six. Most people will have a contact on, say, your anterior teeth. But these posterior contacts, we kind of encompass them in working side interferences. So that's why when keeping it simple, we can discuss anterior guidance as the anterior teeth. 
and then we have our posterior guidance and a lot of people would think posterior guidance would be the posterior teeth whereas in reality it's not it's the tmj so the actual architecture of your tmj the shape the angle the steepness the length of your glenoid fossa this is what is actually your posterior guidance and as we cannot change this we just need to be aware that this is what posterior guidance is so analysis of the patient so when we're doing treatment with patients and especially in restorative we need to follow something called edict principles so when we treat patients we need to examine design execute and check and these stages help us understand the patient's occlusion and make sure we're doing what we need to be doing so when we examine the patient we need to know what we're starting with and we can compare it to something called ideal occlusion and i'll get on to what ideal occlusion is further on in the powerpoint so there's something called the three minute articulatory exam this is part of it on the right which we'll go through semi in a minute an examination and the articulatory exam is the most important stage of the edec principles if we don't know what we're working with we don't know what we start with we don't know what we're going to do we don't know how to design certain restorations we don't know what we need to conform to and we don't know how we can adjust it so this is why it's extremely important to examine the patient's actual occlusion to start with so if I take you to the right hand side, this is like a small version of the three minute articulatory exam. So we look at the patient's skeletal class, their angles classification, and then their static occlusion, which I'll get onto in the next slide with something called an occlusal sketch. We want to be looking, does CO equal CR? So does the patient's centric occlusion equal their centric relation? And I'll go into this. So this is, does the patient's most relaxed position of tooth position equal the most relaxed jaw position and the reality of this in 90 percent it doesn't so in 10 percent of the population co equals cr but 90 percent it doesn't but this isn't necessarily bad as i'll explain later we don't as people need ideal occlusion we can live with what we have and long as our neuromuscular programming gets used to it and we are fine with it we don't need ideal occlusion all ideal occlusion is, is something that we can incorporate in restorations that reduces the chance of problems. So then we look at something about if CO doesn't equal CR, we just describe the difference between it. Is there any freedom in centric occlusion? So what I did before when I spoke to you said, bite in CO, move your teeth, and if there's any space, great. You're less likely to fracture certain restorations like veneers. And if there, is any, if there isn't any centric, um, freedom in centric, this is something we may need to incorporate into design of prosthesis or design of restorations. Carrying on, so then we assess the dynamic occlusion, like I said before. We look for any, if there's any non-working side interferences, and if so, we record them. We look if there's any um, working side interferences, if there's any crossover, what guidance the patient is, whether it be canine or whether it be group function. So if we're doing certain, um, say, bridges or build-ups, we know what guidance that the patient has so we're not going to end up breaking restorations in the long term and then at the end we look does this patient have anything abnormal do they have any tooth wear what kind of tooth wear any signs of active tooth wear like tongue scalloping or cheek ridging okay so this is just part of the examination stage one part of it which is extremely important okay so when we're treating patients um, we either go through something called the conformative approach or the reorganized approach. And we'll go through the conformative approach first. Conformative approach. So the conformative approach by a lot of tutors and a lot of people you'll speak to, they'll say, do the conformative approach because it's the most simple. Well, in reality, it's not the most simple. It's the safest. Because the fact that when we're conforming, we've been safe, the patient knows the occlusion, the patient already has that occlusion, so we're not going to introduce any problems. To say it's the simplest, in, when in reality, we need to check what the patient's occlusion is. We need to design our restorations, check them, and then make sure they have conformed. That is not the simplest, that is the safest. And then a nice little definition by Dr. Stephen Davis, who teaches a lot of occlusion for us at Manchester. The conformative approach provides restorations that are in harmony with the existing jaw relationship. So if, it is, if it's in harmony, we're conforming and the patient will be fine because they'll be used to that occlusion. Okay, so simple direct restorations we'll talk about. So when do you need to check your patient's occlusion? 
obviously the answer there it's first and this is something that I, I reckon 80 plus percent of the time students don't do at least from my experience at university as you can see this is a patient that I treated on the right hand side here and this is the lower right arch and you want to check the patient's occlusion before you even touch the teeth with the handpiece even before you start looking at the patient in reality because as soon as you touch a tooth of the handpiece, and especially in the areas of decay, you're likely going to lose your reference points for your occlusion. Further, I discuss the points that you need to ideally do it on early in the appointment, check the patient's occlusion. And this is because, as I explained before, within the articulatory system, it's, it's kind of got a balance. So the fact that you've got your muscles and mastication, your TMJ joint, and your occlusion. And again, if you change one of them, you'll get a problem in the other. So a patient that is at LA will have muscles with less force from reception due to being inhibited. So if you've got muscles that are weaker, you will get a changed occlusion. If you've got tired muscles from being open for the whole session, the rubber dam, you'll get a change in occlusion. If you've got TMJ problems, so this is what we need to check in the articulatory exam, you'll have a changed occlusion. So we need to be making sure we're taking an occlusal assessment of the patient before we've even done anything. This to make sure that the occlusion that we've actually got is an accurate representation of the patient's occlusion. So what we do is something called an occlusal sketch. Some of you may have seen this. There's a couple of methods. So what we do, on clinic we have a couple different types of articulating paper. We have the horseshoe one, which everyone knows, and people rip in half sometimes. We have the little pack of long, thin articulating paper. And these are the ones we want to use, not the horseshoe. The horseshoe articulating paper is for complete dentures. Patients who are complete dentures can get used to different occlusal changes differently. And this is why we need a more accurate articulating paper for simple direct restorations. So we want to be using 40 micron articulating paper, which is your rectangular ones. And that comes in red and blue. And that does at Manchester. I don't know if that's the same everywhere else. I myself choose red for the static occlusion and blue for the dynamic. But long as you choose what you want and stick with it from patient to patient, you'll get the same results. So what you want to do, and many of you have seen it, you put it on forceps, get them to bite on it, and, and then we'll see an occlusal pattern on the actual teeth. So what I do myself is I'll use blue articulating paper for dynamic occlusion, so get them to bite on it, laterally skirt or protrude, and this will put your nice smears of blue articulatory marks on the teeth. Then, I then what I do is I'll record it and then I'll get my red articulating paper and get the patient to bite down in centric occlusion. This means that I'm not smearing my red marks. So if I've done the lateral movements first and then you do the static, this means your static um, occlusal marks won't be, won't be like smeared everywhere. With your static occlusal marks, your red ones, you, you'll have light red ones and dark red ones. The lighter they are means the lighter the contact. The darker they are means the darker the contact. And this means that it's a really tight occlusal place here. So this is somewhere which you'll be needing to make sure you haven't changed because the patient will be highly occlusally wearing these places. So this is it on the right. A picture, you have a, a pre-made jaw and you just mark where the static and dynamic occlusion is. Um, as we get used to better photography and people get more skilled with photography, and what we can do now is literally make these occlusal marks on the teeth and take pictures. So we can either do a hand-drawn one or a picture, and then we do what we want. We either look at them ourselves or we're in the indirect restorations, give them to the lab. So this is something called shim stock. As I just discussed, in the static occlusal contacts, we have heavy and light static contacts, which are red marks. In our heavy occlusal contacts, these will be most likely to be able to or not able to hold something called shim stock. So this isn't used routinely on clinic, but it should be because it's very, very precise. So it's a thin foil material that is eight microns thick. So if you remember, the actual articulating paper was 40 microns thick. This is eight microns, so it's very precise. So in these tight static occlusal contacts, the heavy red marks on the articulatory sketch we test these shimtok holds. So we think this is a heavy point, this red point here on this tooth. We put the shimstock foil there, get the patient to bite down and pull it. If it pulls through, it's not a hold. 
If it stays, then it is a hold. And we know that this area is highly occlusally aware and it's a tight contact. So we can use this as a reference for the occlusion. Okay. I'll talk more about shimstock holds when we talk about indirect restorations because it's more a thing we do with crowns and bridge work. Okay. Okay, it's a simple indirect. So when we've actually examined the occlusion, we know what we need to conform to. Like I said before, if we haven't examined, we haven't done an articulatory exam, or we haven't checked the occlusal sketch, we don't know what we need to conform to. So in the EDEC principle, the design, okay? So there's a few ways with simple restorations that we can actually um, design them and be aware of their design for the occlusion. So if we know where the occlusal contacts are on the tooth, we can prep around them. We can remove the decay and be, try and be as minimally invasive as possible and leave where the occlusal contacts are. Obviously, if there's gross caries where the occlusal contacts are, we need to remove the caries, but we just need to be aware that where the old actual occlusal contacts were. Also, we need to be aware when we're designing the restoration that we shouldn't be leaving um, static occlusal contacts on the actual margin of the restoration. Okay, so if we, this is a, a big problem for failure of restorations. If the actual static occlusal contact where the red mark is, is on the margin between say our composite restoration and our tooth, this is where we're gonna get a fracture of the tooth. So as we're now moving to more minimally invasive dentistry, where say we have more than two millimeters of cuspal width, we will do a composite restoration. Um, this means that if we, it's a, it's a relatively thin cusp. So what we want to be doing is making sure that when we're doing our restorations, the actual contact isn't on the margin because this can one, cause cusp fracture, two, cause debonding of the restoration due to trauma down along the lines of the actual bond, or it'll call marginal leakage. So this is why we need to make sure we're not having our static contacts on our restoration margins. So execute, so this is the same patient before and after. We need to um, restore the patient's teeth, make them look good, but the fissures are good to the point where we need to make sure that we're not encroaching on any occlusal contacts. So we'll restore to the patients with composite or with whatever restoration medium we're using and making sure we're aware of the occlusal contacts. For restorations, especially in stuff like MODs or um, class two restorations that involve the marginal ridge, a good tip is don't make your marginal ridge higher than the marginal ridge of the adjacent tooth. This is a quick and easy way of making sure that you're not going to be increasing the occlusion in that patient's tooth. Okay, check. So we've done our restoration, we've restored it, we've made it look nice, made it look sexy, but then we obviously check it and the patient says it's high. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to check the static and dynamic occlusion again with 40 micron articulating paper, investigate if there's any missing contacts that we had before, any red marks that weren't there, or if there's new red marks or heavy ones. Um, and the shim stock, like I said, that's if you've been pedantic. And we need to remember, patients are numb, their proprioception will be different. So we should really stop going, how does that feel to the patient? Because in reality, the patient doesn't know how it feels because they're numb. So we need to be relating back to our occlusal sketch and saying, have we changed the occlusion? No, and that's great. If we have, adjust it and change it so we haven't. So this is a few pictures here. So if anyone can spot where the actual change in occlusion is. So this is our examine stage. So we have um, an upper right quadrant with an upper four with a, a clusal amalgam. Um, so what obviously happened here is that the patient had it changed with a simple composite. Um, however, if you look on the examine one, there is on the distal of the three, there is a mark. Ignore the fact it's blue, it should be red. There's a mark. And then on the occlusion check, there's no mark on the distal of the three. However, there is a very heavy occlusal static contact on the restoration. So what would, have, what would have happened is we would have gone back in the mouth, polished or changed the restoration, and then checked it again. And after we've checked it, if you can see here, the distal of the three, we now have a mark and it's more even and now we've got a more even occlusion 
and this is how we check it. We look for new introduction of new heavy contacts or loss of contacts, adjust our restoration and then check again. And then we should probably end up with what we had before. If anyone's got any questions on this, just pipe them in and we can go out back, back to them with Niji afterwards. Simple indirect restorations. So we still follow the EDEC principle. So we still examine, and this is extremely important in the indirect restorations. We need to do an occlusal sketch, occlusal record, because we ourselves as clinicians aren't fabricating the restorations. As we're sending this restoration off to a laboratory, they need to know what the exact occlusion is because they're blind, they haven't got the patient. So we do our occlusal sketch, and this will get sent to the lab alongside study models, the face bow, and with the occlusal sketch. So with, with design and execute, we can kind of help the technician get the occlusion on this actual indirect restoration perfect. We can prescribe them an actual occlusion for this tooth, and this is what we do. We send off all the lab work and we send off the prescription for the occlusion, which is the occlusal sketch. The lab can then see what the occlusion was on the, on the tooth before crown prep, or they can also see what the occlusion is on the teeth adjacent and the opposite. So then they can then conform to the occlusion when they make the crown. There is a principle, this is the way it gets a bit more complex, so bear with me called the preservation of, a, of, of occlusal contacts. And as I said before, if you've got a patient with a non-working side interference, you don't want to change it. You don't want to change the patient's occlusion or a patient is extremely occlusally aware. You can do this method. So what you do, I've got pictures on the next slide, is that you do your occlusal sketch. You find your static and dynamic occlusion. And then what you do, is that you will do your crown prep, say it's in a ceramic crown prep, you'll prep your tooth. However, you will leave a turret of tissue where the occlusal contact is. So if you go forward and back here. So see here, the upper right five, that palatal contact. Say we're prepping this tooth for a crown, and then this is our crown prep, and this is our um, silicone um, jig to see what our preparation is against. In a normal preparation, as you can see in my not so great outline, is the white line is our normal preparation. However, in the preservation of the occlusal contact method, we would prep everywhere except where that static contact is. And we would leave this turret of tissue out and it would touch the silicone and we would know that this occlusal contact is still there as a reference. So what we do is we prep everywhere, but the, where the first, where that one occlusal contact, or say it might be another one, where two occlusal contacts are on the teeth. This means that when we send this crown off to the lab, the lab have the bite registration we give them, the impression and the occlusal sketch and the exact point of occlusion. So the lab can articulate the study models. They can get this exact point on the crown articulating where it should be with the opposing tooth and then build the crown on the patient Okay, what the lab will do is they will cut the turret of tooth off and then build the crown and it'll have the exact same point occlusion as the tooth did before. You would then get your crown back from the lab, you'd take your temporary crown off and your tooth would obviously have it, that little turret of tissue still stuck on the tooth. All you do is cut it flat or the, or the lab can give you a jig which helps you cut it exactly the same and then you try the crown on and in theory, it should be exactly the same because the lab have had that point of contact and the lab know exactly where that point, point of static occlusion should have been. Okay, so like I said, so if you look here, we'll go back through it again. So the lab will articulate the models. They'll, they'll articulate that turret of tissue. The lab will cut it off and make the crown. You then get the crown back. You cut off that bit of tissue of tooth put your crown on and it should fit perfectly. I'd say very, very minimal amount of people do this, um, but this is a very, very good way of having, um, making sure you haven't changed the occlusion at all in a very highly occlusally aware patient, or if you know certain contacts are there on patients because you've done an exam and you don't want to change it, like non-working side interferences, this is the way that you can make sure you're not changing and you won't get any problems. Okay. 
So then, like I said, we still follow the EDEC principles for the indirect restorations. So you've got your crown back and you need to check it. So we put the crown on and we check the occlusion prior to cementation. We don't want to cement the crown and be like, God, shit, it's high. What I'm going to do now, cut it off. You're cementing people, cementing um, Emax crowns or say zirconia and you can't cut them off for anything. So this is something we need to have a problem with. Um, so what we can do is we check the occlusion with the articulating paper like before. However, with indirect restorations, this is where shim stock holds come in extremely well. So like I explained earlier, when we have very heavy occlusal contacts, there's a likelihood there will be a shim stock hold there. So bear with me these bad pictures on the next slide, I think. So here on the left hand side, not my work, you can see that you have a couple of crowns on the left. Say that you just got these patients in and you'd cemented, you'd try these crowns in. On the left hand side, but on the right hand side, you knew there was a shim stock hold. There was a piece of shim stock that you knew on this exact point, you took it and it doesn't move. Yeah, perfectly. Thanks for everyone's mark that. Um, however, say that crown was high in occlusion. You then try that shim stock hold and it comes straight out because the mouth is propped open. However, say it's perfect. Say you cement the crown, you check the occlusion, it looks great. You try your shim stock hold and then the shim stock hold's still tight. If it is, you know you're within eight microns of accuracy of the occlusion and the patient won't be able to feel that. So if that shim stock hold is still there on the opposing side and you've cemented the crown, you're all good to go. But if you've got a crown and the shim stock comes out, you know you've got a problem. You need either, either to adjust the crown, adjust it and send it off for reglaze, or maybe possibility, especially with some crowns, have to make a total remake. So this is why shim stock holes are very important in indirect restorations. So if anyone wants me to go over shim stock more, I spoke to uh, Aladdin Forthy and he said this might be something we need to go over in more detail. So if you want me to go over this, just drop um, a message for the questions. Okay, so the reorganized approach. So this is the reorganized approach. So when we're not conforming to a patient's current occlusion, we're following the reorganized approach. So if we can avoid the reorganized approach, we must because it's safest. However, there is a lot of indications that we have to actually do the reorganized approach. So when is it not appropriate? So the reorganized approach isn't appropriate in a patient that one isn't motivated and doesn't want it. So if you've got a patient that you think, oh great, toothwear patient, let's do all this work on them, but they don't want a much of a change in their appearance. It's more functional or sensitivity, or a patient doesn't want to go through a long treatment plan. There is no point going through the reorganized approach. You might as well work with what you've got, conform to the patient's occlusion, and just work with that because you need to wean a patient in along a reorganized approach. And patients that can't tolerate long treatment plans, this isn't the best bet. Also, when we can treat in accordance to the conformative approach, that seems obvious. But say we do a restoration, why change the patient's occlusion? If we're doing a simple occlusal cavity, why change it? So if we can conform to the patient's occlusion, then we should be doing it. However, when might a patient benefit from the reorganized approach? So this is a lot of the reasons why. So if the patient wants an increase in the overall vertical dimension, if you need to build the patient up aesthetically, have a significant change in appearance, especially in patients with tooth wear, patients that might want um, four mouth veneers or crowns that we see, any change in overall vertical dimension is a change in the patient's occlusion. So you will be reorganizing the patient's occlusion by the reorganized approach. If we're doing treatment with teeth or tooth or teeth that are significantly out of position, say you've got a patient that's got a massively over-erupted seven due to a missing six or seven, we might need to reorganize the patient's occlusion to make sure that this isn't detrimental. If a patient, say, has um, a large MOD composite and every time you do it, a cusp fractures, this is because probably the tooth isn't in ideal occlusion. So what we need to make it do is make sure we change the patient's occlusion so then we're not getting pathological fail constantly. So this is another reason why we would do a reorganized approach. Last one, it's not really needed to understand, but if a patient has a TMJ disorder and we've done successful splint therapy, we've gone through our, our anterior positioning splints and stuff like this, 
or our stabilization splints and they're still having problems, it might be due to a deranged occlusion. And this is something we might need to change some stuff that they have. But we can kind of ignore that because that's out the remit of 99% of people. So the reorganized approach, we're still following the EDEC principle, but it's slightly adjusted. For the fact that I said before, when we're treating patients occlusally, we need to change things little by little, and this will reduce the chance of problems and failure. So we examine a three minute articulatory exam, our occlusal sketch, all our special tests, our CR records, our face bows. We design, so we design using schemes of ideal occlusion, which I'll explain later on. We need to execute in provisionals. So in the reorganized approach, we have two execution and two check stages. So we execute in our provisionals. So whether that be mock-ups of um, lux attempt or um, pro temp or provisional crowns or provisional veneers, so the patient can get used to them. The patient can get used to the occlusion, the patient can get used to the aesthetics and we can change if necessary. We check and monitor. If the patient is happy, we're happy, we move on. If they're not, we change it, we tweak it, we, cheat, we tweak the occlusion, and then we check again. If they're happy, we move on. So we do each stage and don't move on until we're happy. And this is how we can make sure that we're not having problems with patients, and especially when we're changing the occlusion in such dramatic ways. So then we execute in, in restorative treatment, that being composite bonding, composite buildups, crowns, veneers, anything like that, dentures, if so. Check, monitor, and that's you done. So we'll talk about this in more detail. So this is it. We always get asked this question, or if you're not too sure, we'll go, well, what's the best occlusion for my patient? And in reality, there is no such thing as the best occlusion. It's more the most tolerated occlusion. So the term best is reality. If the patient is, can tolerate the occlusion, then this is the best occlusion for a patient. And the best occlusion for a patient is one that they can neuromuscularly tolerate. If they can't tolerate it, then it's not the best for them. And the terms ideal occlusion is what we'll go on to. An ideal occlusion has multiple layers. And the, the ideas of ideal occlusion will help a patient have the best tolerated occlusion. Okay, so there's no such thing as best occlusion, it's the most tolerated occlusion. So ideal occlusion, there's three levels. There's the tooth level, the system level, and the patient level. And the tooth and system are kind of kind of interlinked. So ideal occlusion on the tooth level. I'll let you write this down if people need it. So multiple simultaneous contacts, we want this. So when we're designing the occlusion and do a sketch, we have multiple simultaneous static occlusion, so we've got no high areas. We want cusp to fossa contacts, no cusp to incline. So when the cusp of an upper tooth is hitting the, the middle of the fossa of the lower tooth, that's what we want. We don't want cusp to cusp or cusp to incline, incline contacts, because this is when we put stresses on the tooth, the teeth and the restorations, and this is where we get more chances of failure. We want contacts along the long axis of the tooth, this reduces occlusal trauma and the teeth work obviously best if the actual full occlusal load is down the long axis of the tooth. And then we want smooth and shallow guidance. So this can be explained in um, when we do protrude our teeth forward, we want to not be moving over a long space. So say this was our front two teeth. If we had a non-shallow guidance, the arm sizes would be like this and we'd be moving long distances to protrude. This is a side view. If we had a shallow guidance, it would only have to move this short distance. So we'll go into this in more detail. So we want a smooth and shallow anterior guidance, meaning that our posterior teeth quickly become apart and we don't have to have long periods of pressure on our restorations. So this means that our restorations have a better end outcome and won't fail as often. So ideal occlusion on a system level, so as I said before, we want something, we want CO equals CR, so centric occlusion equal in centric relation. We want to be able to have the most relaxed position of the jaw, the same as the most relaxed position of maximal intercrustation. So this doesn't necessarily mean we need to change it to this, but if we're designing a four mouth buildup, four mouth crowns, four mouth composites, two surface loss cases, if we have these positions equal to each other, it means it's more ideal and won't fail as often. 
Next point, we want to have freedom in centric occlusion. I discussed this earlier, when you're biting in centric occlusion, you want to be, have some play, you want to have some freedom to move. If, it's, if we don't have freedom, this means that the restorations are more likely to fail due to fracture and be under more occlusal forces. We want canine guidance over group function in majority of times. Some patients, group function selectively might be better. However, just for the fact that as the canine is the furthest away from the TMJ compared to the premolars, there'll be less occlusal forces on the canine. Also, biomimetrically, the canine is biconvex, sorry, so it's curved like this in comparison to, and this actual anatomy and biometrically, the canine has better design to have occlusal forces. This means there'll be less stress around the neck of the tooth, and this means that your restorations on the tooth will fail less lightly having canine guidance. You want anterior guidance that allows immediate posterior disclusion. So when you move your teeth forward, so you try it. So if you protrude your mouth forward like this, your back teeth don't touch. This is what we want. So if our anterior teeth allow immediate posterior disclusion, we get less failure of posterior teeth. And like I said before, absence of non-working side interferences. If we're designing occlusion, we don't want to introduce a non-working side interference as this could cause a problem with temporal and mandibular joint disorders. So an ideal occlusion on the patient level. So ideal occlusion on the patient level comes from the fact that if a patient has it on a tooth level and a system level, they will most likely have an ideal occlusion on a patient level. So an ideal occlusion on a patient level is one that they can neuromuscularly tolerate. And an ideal occlusional scheme on a tooth and system level, like I said, will help this. So you've got your tooth, your system, and your patient level, okay? So any questions on what you've just said, quickly drop them in, type them into Niji, and then we can continue this bit. So this one we're going to now is a case patient of mine. I'll talk about briefly about some of the medical side of it, just because for, um, just for the completeness of the case, and I'll go through it too quickly. Uh, and then we'll talk about how certain ideal occlusal schemes are built into a wax up and the tooth surface loss patient so a patient can have a more predictable outcome. Okay, so this patient we had, he had widespread tooth wear and he had a failing mobile implant retained bridge, upper left quadrant, which you'll see in a bit. He was unable to eat, however, there's evidence that patients can eat fine, but that was what he said. And he was self conscious about his appearance. I'll quickly go through the meds. Medical history, he broke his back. He had something called trachea bronchiomalacia, where his windpipe kept closing, which was a nightmare. Had heart failure, pulmonary embolisms, diabetes, which affects his healing and stuff. The hypertension, he had osteoporosis, which means obviously that the likelihood of him being on bisphosphate medication, which he was, which you'll get onto. He had chronic pain, he was depressed, and he had COPD. So he was quite medically compromised. This is half his medication. I won't stay on this for long so that's some of it he was on asthma medication blood pressure medications pain meds this is more he so he was also on alandrolic acid and omeprazole and pred so these are his medications however these are the ones that really mattered in the treatment plan for this patient so for the patient a lot of you will know who have been revising anything past probably third year that we follow something called sd -SEP guidelines so if you haven't looked or you're in younger years, search SD SEP guidelines on bisphosphonate use. So this patient was taking oral alandronic acid for six years. And obviously the fact that it's been over six years puts the patient into a high risk category following SD SEP guidance. He also had been taking um, systemic glucocorticoids, so prenicillone, and furthermore in contribution to the alandronic acid, the combination of these two medications would put him at high risk of um, bisphosphonate related osteoarthritis necrosis, so the jaw. He was also on omeprazole. This shows that he had gourd, and however, it was a relatively high dose of omeprazole, and this was um, historic tooth wear, and he was under control with his acid reflux. So we examined him. So we did sensibility tests. The teeth that were present and we thought would have normal responses had normal responses. He was high caries risk. So the ADA, American Association of Dental, have a nice caries risk assessment. 
He has xerostomia. He had a bit of caries present under one of the crowns, which we'll show you. And these factors together, due to a recurrent failure of restorations and caries within six months, alongside the fact that he had caries and he was xerostomic, would put him in high caries risk. We did a BP. So maxillary, he was code twos. So he had some plaque retentive factors. And um, the implant, I don't know why I didn't change that. That implant was, five, was a code two as well for the fact that um, he had um, he had calculus on, he had, a, he had um, a rough surface on the implant abutments and the bridge. Mandibular, he had a code three, we'll show you that, and he had code ones elsewhere. So peri-risk assessment we did, and he was um, relative for peri-risk assessment, I'd say medium risk. He did oral cancer screen, as we should do with any patient, he was over the age of 60, previously smoked cigars and stuff, However, he didn't smoke anymore, so he would have been higher risk for cancer, but oral cancer, but he was a tolerable risk now. We did an occlusal assessment, three minute articulatory exam, like I've been banging on about. We did articulated study models with a CR by registration, which I'll explain how to do one. Face bone, primary imps, radiographs, which I'll show, won't go into too much details, and then we did a tooth wear index. So tooth wear index, so we did a BWE. The majority of his wear was erosive based, so his primary erosion, secondary attrition, and a bit of abfraction. So people think we can do BWE just for erosion. In reality, a BWE is similar to a BP, it's just a screen. So we can still use BWE for any tooth wear in reality. So the mouth split into six um, sextants, and we do a combined score. So grade zero is no evidence of tooth loss. So me and you, normal people. Grade one is initial loss of surface texture. So in our erosive cases, we have initial loss of surface texture, especially occlusally and laterally. Grade two, less than 50% of tooth surface loss, and grade three, more. And then we get a combined score, and then we can assess the patient. This patient's score was 14. In some quadrants, he had missing teeth. So this shows that he actually was a high need to actually consider restorations. And our, the link to this was through, um, it's at the end of the restoration, at the end of the PowerPoint. So this was the patient. You can see he's got quite widespread tooth wear, especially in the lower right anterior quadrant. He had a failing crown, upper right four, and he had some previously failed restorations by the looks of the anterior teeth. And he also had um, uh, upper left five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six implant zirconia bridge, which was mobile. This is the pictures from all the views. So this is his right, middle and anterior views, retracted pictures, and then you can see. So the tooth wear was widespread, very bad in the lower right quadrant, more or less down to the gingival level. He had a crown upper right side, which was doing grand, and then a crown on the upper right again, which was needing replacing. He had the failing implants, which we referred to the tutor that was planning this alongside me, and he was gonna get these implants either a new bridge or them taken out dependent on the cause of the mobility. This was the implant again. We'll quickly go through radiographs because I don't want to bore you them, but he had obvious tooth wear. The lower left six had a failing crown with caries and the lower left seven obviously had furcation and was mobile. The lower right six, this was a historic radiograph. I didn't take the radiograph, so this tooth had already been taken out. And apart from that, you can see there is general tooth wear, a bit of widening of the periodontal ligament. However, that is indicative of patients who have tooth wear. Upper right quadrant with the upper right six crown, that's great, and the four which needed replacing. And then the upper anteriors and the upper left with the implant. There was no PG as well, but coronavirus stopped me getting that from the hospital. Okay, so we've seen the patient's background. So the patient wasn't in pain, so we didn't need to do any emergency treatment. For stabilization, we did oral hygiene advice, toothbrush instruction, you draw a fat 5000, which was needed for the patient. Initial periodontal therapy for the code threes. The lower left six, we hand excavated the carriers out of that and filled with GIC for the point of being as minimally invasive as possible. And we didn't want to take the crown off, end up say, thinking, oh God, we've ended up with no tooth surface to recrown or we didn't want to end up exposing pulp because as you could see on the radiographs, it wasn't retreated. And then, like I said before, the implant was done privately in a different dentist. It failed, so we couldn't touch these implants. 
So after I'd done a mock-up and wax up and we had a set of clues or scheme made, they would then, at a private practice, take the um, bridge off and replace the implants in keeping with the new occlusal treatment plan. So the treatment plan options for this patient. So in toothwear patients over the age of about 50, 60, full mouth crowns is probably the best option. It's a controversial view, but we're now with minimal prep and the fact that um, we can, we can um, do minimal preps and it's less invasive alongside the fact that patients who, have, uh, who are older, their crowns will probably uh, well, stay till they die is a, good, a good, is a good treatment option. However, with the fact this patient was on alendronic acid for six years and was a high risk to bisphosphonate and to emronge, we want to be as minimally invasive as possible. We didn't want to be doing crown lengthening due to healing of soft tissue and hard tissue. So the treatment option we chose was treatment option one, which was full mouth composite buildups and replace the failed metal ceramic crown upright four with a composite crown to be in keeping with the restoration. So records needed. So we need to do articulated study models. So going back, so this is when we would do a C eccentric relation record. So we are doing a reorganized occlusal approach. So we want a centric relation record. We did upper and lower impressions, obviously, and then we did a face bow. So face bow is a maxillary record. It records the maxilla to the condyles in the front foot mandibular plane. This means the, um, the lab can articulate the model and get it in keeping with the actual patient's condyles. Um, so it's even highly more occlusally um, patterned. And then we did a CR record. So what is centric relation? Um, right, okay, this isn't the saved original. Okay, so we'll talk it through. So, so you have three things, so you have positional. So the positional is the fact that the actual condyle um, is in the, we have to say, we'll ignore positional for now. So it's anatomical. So it's a position where the condylar head is in the most superior anterior region of the glenoid fossa, okay? So people discuss the most superior, or people say distal, so it's the most superior anterior, and that is the same as the most superior distal facing. So this is where people get the distal from. So it's the most superior anterior region, or the superior most distal face, facing region of the glenoid fossa. Then the functional is the position where the, man, maxil, where the, where the muscles of mastication are in their most relaxed position. Um, and I don't know why my position is like that. Okay, so why take a CR bite record? So the centric relation bite record, as we said, it's a most reproducible position of the TMJ. So the patient is restored into centric relation because they will be the most relaxed and it's the most likely position to restore them into that they will be able to tolerate. And also in centric relation, we obviously in these terms of a reorganized approach, we worry about how much we need to open patients up. So I've got a two fair patient, how much do I open them up? How much can they tolerate? So if we, um, if we treat patients in centric relation, there is possibility of space in centric relation. And I'll explain this. So this is something called possets envelope. First thing I want to draw your attention to is the incisor teeth on the bottom right of the picture. And this is the upper anterior incisors and the lower anterior incisors. So what we need to be aware of is that these marks, this graph showing the black line is the path the lower incisor takes. So if we start at CO, which we know is our centric occlusion, this is the point where the teeth are like in the same picture as the bottom. As we protrude our teeth forward, so you can do this as a talk, we protrude our teeth forward, the lower teeth will move down the upper teeth. And from CO, as we can see on the graph, it moves down, that's the black line, to the point of E, which is edge to edge. At edge to edge, there is no change in occlusal height until we protrude forward and then there is less space. So that's what you can see moving from CO to E to PR. So if we bring you back to centric occlusion, where you're biting together normally, if you then retrude your jaw back as far as possible, 
to the first contact of your tooth, ideally. At this point, if you can retrieve your jaw back, everyone try and do it as we talk, you'll find a contact. This contact will probably be at the back. Some people might be a bit further forward, but the rest of your teeth are open. And this change in height, which proves there is space in your mouth, is this slide between CO and CR. So like I said, 90% of the people will not have will have a difference. So this means there may be space to build up the patient in centric relation. And then they can get used to this. They have this space, it's normal space. We don't need to be propping patients up. We don't need to be opening them up excessively. We can build the patient's teeth up in wax ups, in provisionals, in building them up in tooth surface loss cases. We can steal occlusal vertical dimension between centric relation and centric occlusion. So we're not increasing their OVD massively. We're just taking some space available. If it's enough, great, we haven't changed anything. But if we need to um, actually increase it more, then we're only increasing it a little bit more. We've took space between CO and CR and then opened it up a couple of millimeters. And this is how we can get away with opening patients up. So how to take a CR record? So by manipulation of the mandible into centric relation is difficult. So we kind of end up needing deprogramming devices, especially in patients that have had um, deranged occlusions, patients that have had a lot of tooth surface loss for a long time. Um, this means that they can't get into this emotional relax position because they're so used to a position that they've put together so they can occlude. So we use deprogramming devices. There's three or real, there's multiple real ones, but these are three. So we have tongue depressors, a normal tongue depressor, a Lucia jig, which we'll get onto, and something called a gothic arch trace, which we can, can ignore, but I'll put it there for, for the full side of it. Gothic arch trace is used for dentures, but we'll talk about tongue depressors and Lucia jig. So deprogramming device is the tongue depressor. So this is what most of you can do in clinic. This is the easiest thing to get. So you get a wooden tongue depressor, get them to bite on it between their anterior teeth for five minutes, and this will disseclude the posterior teeth. Biting on this for five minutes will deprogram the muscles of mastication. They're going to like spasm, then relax, and you'll be able to actually manipulate the jaw back into this centric relation position. Because the muscles are relaxed, you push the jaw back, find the first contact, and then you know this is a position of their CR, or at least in the terminal hinge access. So what we do, as we can keep playing and we've got this jaw loose and the muscles relaxed, we can work out, is there a first contact in central relation? If there is, keep finding this first contact. Move the patient's jaw back till this contact, get the patient to point and be like, is this the contact? They say, yes, great. And keep getting them used to being able to find this contact. Another device is something called a Lucia jig. So it's a little bit of acrylic, like a button that you fill with silicone and it molds the front teeth. The patient can slide backwards and forth on the Lucia jig and this deprograms the muscles of mastication again. So what happens is, is the patient's mouth is open at the back, the teeth are discluded and the patient can uh, move backwards and forwards and the muscles of mastication become relaxed. The further back the patient moves, I've got pictures of this, the furthest point back the patient moves is the point of centric relation. You record it and then I'll show you how for both with the a Lucia jig or with a tongue depressor, a tongue depressor we can take a centric relation record. So CR without a Lucia jig, so with a tongue depressor, we've deprogrammed, we've used a tongue depressor, we found the first contact in centric relation. So the first contact is there, but all the other teeth are open. We get a bowl of green stick or a ball of silicone impression putty, roll it up and get them to bite into it. Their front teeth won't be fully closed through, but the CR point will still be there as I'll show in the next picture. So you see here, imagine this, this obviously not green stick, this red bit is green stick. The posterior teeth are discluded, but the biting into this material at the front. When this material at the front sets, we then get our futile D, our bite registration material, and we squirt it between the posterior teeth that are discluded. This then helps us lock in our record of centric relation. 
the patient will then open up slightly. You'll remove this red bit or the green bit, whatever you've used, green stick or wax or silicone, and then you'll just pipe together and you'll get a full record, your full arch um, silicone bite registration. And this will be in centric relation. And that's what you'll end up with. So what you'd end up with is um, you'd pipe the sides first, take the bite reg record from the front out, the loose CG, the tongue depressor or the green stick, and then pipe the silicone impression material around the front. CR record with a Lucia jig. So you move them backwards and forwards. You record the most distal aspect, as you can see here. So the patients move backwards on the Lucia jig. The dentist here has marked it with a probe or he would draw with a pencil or add composite to it there so that the patient can rest on that point. When the patient, as you can see, there's a little black line that's the point of centric relation. He pushes the jaw back to that point and he knows the patient is in centric relation. He then will pipe um, your silicone impression material, your futile D on the patient's back teeth, manipulate the patient back to that position and wait for the silicone to set. When the silicone set, he'll remove the Lucia jig and then just join the impression material back up until it sets and then again, you'll get the complete bite record in centric relation. If anyone wants me to go over that more, drop a message. Okay, so planning and design. So this is where it's really important for the reorganized approach. So case planning, we need good impressions. We need a face bow to make it as most accurate as possible. We need a centric relation record, which I just discussed, and we need a smile design. So either digital or hand-drawn or some kind of record that you can be like, the, the patient knows what's going on as well as the lab, as well as an occlusal sketch because then the lab knows exactly what's going on. So the production of study models is your baseline. You know what tooth wear you're working with, you know what you've gone for from, and you know what you've gone to with your wax up. And this is good from a medical legal standpoint because you can always show you better the patient. So like I said, we duplicate the models and do a wax up. So for this case, we did an increase around three millimeters in the overall vertical dimension. It was quite closed. So we took some space in CR, built them at three millimeters, and then it provides an aesthetic outcome. Design, so I watched again, EDEC design principle. So the lab did a wax up alongside my digital, digital design, which wasn't digital as you'll see. Um, and we follow ideal occlusal schemes. So this is what the design principle for this wax should be. It should follow an aesthetic design that you want and also ideal occlusion. And this is how we make it work. If the patient follows ideal occlusion, then it's gonna be a, a, a good outcome. So like I said before, within the design, we want the wax up to have multiple simultaneous contacts. We want the occlusion to be even. We want to make sure that not one tooth is taking a lot of the occlusal force. And this means that the restorations will help each other in harmony. We want cusped to foster contacts. We want to make sure there's no cusp to incline. So there's on the wax up, we can see this and there's not going to be any problems with our restorations. We want contacts along the long axis of the tooth. We want to be able to see this on the wax up when we articulate the wax up study models. We can see that there's contacts along the long axis of the tooth, which is beneficial for the patient. Smooth and shallow guidance. So we all know that our um, articulators can move in lateral movements and protrusive movements. So we check this, we check, are our teeth moving long distances when we protrude? Ideally with our wax up, no. Some cases they might have to a little bit, but as long as we're following smooth and shallow guidance as close as we can, it means that our restorations will, ch will um, have less likelihood of breaking and have less likelihood of failure due to not moving long distances along the anterior teeth. We ideally wanted to build in CO equals CR so that the wax up centric occlusion is in the same position as the jaw relationship. We want to have freedom in centric. We can check this on the wax up. When the wax up's in centric occlusion on the articulator, we can move it slightly. And if there's space, we know we've got freedom in centric occlusion. Canine guidance, ideally for this case was canine guidance. We again, we can test it on the articulator. When we do large excursive movements, which teeth are touching, ideally the canines. And these are all the schemes of ideal occlusion. 
And then again, anterior guidance. We do protrusive movements on our wax up. Do the front teeth have equal guidance and do the back teeth disocclude? Perfect if they do. So this is how we've designed our wax up with the ideal occlusal scheme to make sure that the patient's actual restorations are gonna have the best chance of being able to be tolerated. So this is the patient. Took a picture, drew up a digital diet design, being extra on that. But it's good because what is the point of you designing a patient's smile if you have no end say? You're going to end up just sending your work to the lab. You have a vision, the patient has a vision, but then the lab technician at the end of the day, if you don't tell him what you want doing, will dictate how it looks. So like I said, execute and check for the EDEC principles. For number one, so we do a trial smile. So we follow the EDEC principles. So we do the examine, we've designed, and now we execute and check in temporaries. So the benefits of temporization is the fact that it allows the patient to view the end result and it aids in valid consent. The patient can see what's going on. They can, um, they can change the treatment plan. They can say, I don't want to do this. Or they can say, great, I really like this. I consent to this moving on. It allows the patient to test ride the occlusion. They can feel how the end result's going to feel. They can see if there's anything that's in early contact. We can assess the patient's occlusion in the temporaries. We can see if there's any interferences or any occlusion that we may need to change. And we can adjust this. We can use our um, hand pieces or anything or we can, we can add and we can then change the occlusion if necessary. We can do this with the patient's actual aesthetics as well. We can add composite or we can add stuff like pro temp or um, lux attempt the actual wax up and then this will allow the patient to have a changed aesthetic outcome um, and then like i said yeah we can do additions so if we do do additions to the patient's actual um occlusion or the patient's aesthetics all we do then is then take a new impression send it to the lab the lab will articulate the new aesthetics or the new build-ups or the new shape or the new occlusion and then we can go from there. We can then retrial it and then see how the patient gets on. So this is what we do. We take an impression in silicone of the wax up. We then squirt in your lux attempt or your pro temp. And then we, all we do is seat it on the patient and you go from a worn dentition to a dentition with mocked up teeth. So as you can see in the top right, we cut V-notches where the papilla are. And because the papilla is not going to need any restorative material, it works perfectly as a little wells for the restorative material to come out. So that's a top tip. Cut V-notches where the papilla are when you're temporizing anything, even temporary crowns. So as you can see, it's a nice result. The patient can see what they're going to more or less end up with. They can try the occlusion out. He said, this feels great. The patient said, this feels like what my teeth used to feel like. Um, and then what I did, in hindsight, I might should not have done this, but we kept the temporaries on. The patient went home in the temporaries, um, but they were all stuck together, obviously, because it's all together. So this could have been um, poor for the patient's periodontal status. So if you're going to do it, make sure your patient's perio is up to scratch before you start temporizing whole arches and keeping them on. If the patient's perio isn't good and you still want to do a mock-up, mock-up, see what they're like, take them off. You can flick it off or cut it off section like you normally do within a crown. So this is what I said. Impressions, soak your wax up in water. It makes such a difference. Your wax up doesn't break off. You haven't got your nice wax up from the lab. You take an impression and all your wax is in your impression. Like I said, cut notches where the papilla are. Your excess temporary material comes out and it makes it a lot easier to clean up afterwards. Pipe your pro temp temporize the whole arch and then adjust necessarily. So restore, when we're happy with the trial smile, we can move on to the restorative phase. We've trialed the aesthetics, we've trialed the occlusion, we're no longer reorganizing, we're conforming. And that's the beauty of having multiple stages. Soon as we can find a tolerated occlusion with our temporaries, all we do is conform to it. And then we know that our restorations are definitive and that are costly and that only we want to be making once we're only going to make them once because we know the patient is already used to that occlusion so this is a few way of building what we did so this is what you do you get your wax up silicone backboard this is what we did there's a couple of other methods i was messing around with but we didn't work so you can take an impression in clear silicone and do injection composite 
So your PTFE tape every other worn tooth, inject heated flow or composite into the tooth, and then polish, and then move on to the next tooth. But we did the silicone backboard technique. So another heavy slide, unfortunately. So silicone backboard was chosen. We kept the mock-up on. This is the beauty of having a mock-up. If you've got a mock-up, the overall vertical dimension is set. The occlusion is set. All you need to do is do take one arch off, so take the temperatures off for the mandibulars, and then build up the mandibular ones in composite in your restorative material, and then send them home. The patient still has the upper temperatures, they have the new composites, and they've got the same occlusion. And then all you've got to do then is bring them back next time, take the temperatures off the uppers, and do the uppers. So what we did, a few tips on the cases like this, the tooth surfaces were pumiced, with a slurry of pumice to remove um, the acquired pellicle, and this increases in bonding. The tooth was also roughened with, um, with a burr to increase micromechanical retention to enamel and dentine. We know we want to bond to prismatic enamel, and that's why we need to roughen the enamel up. We all know that dentine actual bonding is, is a reduced bonding. I think it's like less than 30 megapascals compared to your enamel. And um, so what we do, we roughen the dentine and this increases the surface area for micromechanical retention. So that's what we did. We heated up composite. So if you're ever doing composite, heat it up. I put, you put your composite in your dental lights in the, in the restorative clinic um, and heated restorative flows better. It's got a greater chance of polymerization. It's got a greater surface toughness and it's got a better ability to be polishable, to heat your composite. But make sure you're not going crazy. If you heat it past like 60 degrees, you get gaseous impurities and the composite will just lose at how it should look. So what we do, like I said, you take your, you take your temperatures off, you build them up, and then you don't polish them. You want to make sure that composite setting, and you want to make sure that you probably don't have time to do it anyway. You want to be doing this later on at a second separate appointment. So like I said, next appointment, the maxillary temperatures were removed, the teeth were pumiced again, and roughened with fine burrs, silicone backboard, and then we just built it up. So then the patient had the full mouth together. Um, with the crown, remove the temporary crown. We knew what the patient's occlusion was because we had already prescribed it. We had the occlusal sketch. The lab had the wax ups already. So all we did was we took the crown off, we prepped it, no carers, and then all we did was temporize it with the new occlusion and the lab had the exact occlusal record which was perfect we just changed the crown cemented it and it fit perfectly because obviously the occlusion was had equal um, static occlusion which was built into the wax up so then refine the composites finish them with polishing stuff like we did before and this was the end result so the patient was built up um, with all with composite the lower right ones are temporary still because that was coronavirus stopped us with that. But there's a big difference. Um, and, it, and this is the thing. Restorations like this, you've done all the work, hard work. You need to just make sure you're following ideal occlusal schemes. These anterior teeth have shallow guidance. This means that the likelihood due to the fact that especially that upper right two there's not much tooth tissue. The upper left tooth, there's not much tooth tissue, but they're normal looking incisors after you've restored them. So you need to be having shallow guidance to make sure that when you have anterior guidance, your lower incisors are moving over those teeth, you're reducing the pressure on the teeth, and this will reduce the chance of failure. Also again, having stuff like um, freedom and centric occlusion, the fact that when he's biting together, he's not locked in, he's got a bit of movement in centric occlusion, means that he's not constantly putting pressure on his anterior teeth that are quite heavily built up. So this is his before and after. Like I said before, um, close some black triangles. Um, could have ideally, if he had a longer time, polished them up better and refined them, but he was happy with what he had. So these are some of the sources I used. I must be wanted to say thank you to Stephen Davis because his papers are extremely, extremely good. So if you search um, Dr. Stephen Davis um, occlu occlusal papers, it's through um, the BDJ and Nature. Some of the pictures, especially the, the um, impression of the wax up and the wax ups are style Italiano. 
and then these are some of the stuff I use for the um, the pictures of the shim stock. And any questions? I know that's been a long one and very heavy. Um, any questions? I'll happily answer anything. Well, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting. Um, we've got a couple of questions, but I think from like. I don't know about everybody else, but I think occlusion is something that I think we all think that once we've used articulating paper that we've like completely addressed it. But you know, you've gone into quite a lot of detail and a lot of other things that we need to consider as well. So that's been so helpful. And hopefully we'll get to see some patients this year hopefully, <laughs> yeah. and get to put everything into practice. So thank you so much for that. It was really interesting. Uh, and I've got a question. So you mentioned about um, heating up composite. So how does that affect your working time? and the setting time of it so if you it does change i think your working time reduces slightly um i did find especially though that it's a balance between the fact that if you've got a normal composite and you haven't heated it you take longer to place it yeah so especially with a silicone backboard if you've heated your composite you can manipulate it onto the silicone a lot easier and you can kind of like especially for the labial surfaces of the teeth if it's heated it flows easier so you're not messing around with shaping it as long. So it definitely does set a bit quicker. However, you can work with that a lot easier as well. Perfect, great. Okay, um, so we've got a question. With the occlusal um, preservation method, would you then avoid a bisque stage and go straight to final fit? Okay, um, so a lot, of what, I don't know if that, I don't know if that's from our university or not, but I know from our, uni from our university, they very rarely go to bisque. Um, so the fact with occlusal preservation is the fact that there shouldn't be anything wrong with it. The, the exact static occlusal point should be recorded because yeah, you haven't cut you, that turret of tooth still remains. So there will be no need to be in bisque. You could literally go to final fit and it should be fine. This, this, this method is technically preventing the need to put, say polish down a ceramic and then get it reglazed because you're not, you shouldn't have to adjust the occlusion. The occlusion should already be there prescribed. Okay, and we've got another one as well. Um, would you endodontically treat teeth prior to full mouth crown placement, or would you assume that it would be okay because of the patient's age and likelihood of sclerosis canals? So, um, okay, Te so if the, if the patient was asymptomatic and there was no gross periapical lesion. If there was mild widening of the PDL, especially in a tooth surface loss case, you're gonna get widening of the PDL due to trauma. Because that's what happens with teeth that are traumatized. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't electively root canal. This patient was also an exception to the fact that he would not, he stopped breathing like six times this patient had. So he wouldn't tolerate root canal. He couldn't root canal this patient. Um, if there was a tooth which was like, extremely like sensitive so that you've done your sensibility testings and it was a raised sensibility or the patient that complained of pain so hot and cold symptoms then i'd do a root canal i wouldn't electively root canal on this case especially this as is this composite it gives you the chance in the future if you need to you can um, with crowns the fact that you can always access through a crown and there's no point electively devitalizing a tooth because as soon as you devitalize a tooth the actual, um, the actual tooth hardness, so the crown um, fracture resistance of a tooth reduces due to one, the access cavity, and secondly, due to the fact that the tooth's non-vital, there's less actual water concentration in the dentine. So as soon as you are root treating a tooth, you kind of put it in the cycle of fracture at some point. Fair enough. Okay, and uh, I've got another one here. Is it always necessary for CO2 um, to maximum intercustation. Okay, so the answer quickly is no. So, yeah, like I said before, in ninety percent of the cases in in people watching here, CO doesn't equal CR. It's a phenomenon that happens in about ten percent of the population. Um, but that's so like I definitely don't have CO equal CR because I've got an early contact. However, like I said, the ideal occlusion is different for everyone. It doesn't necessarily have to have CO equals CR. 90% of the population function fine with the fact it's different. It's just if you're going to do a big reorganized case, it is a factor of ideal occlusion. The patient will be most relaxed both in tooth form and in um, 
TMJ and muscles and mastication form. So this means that they're less likely to have problems. So if you're doing a reorganized case, I definitely have CO equals CR. Okay. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Okay. Um, in what cases is it needed to use a face bow as opposed to just a CR bite reg? Um, undergraduate, use face bow as much as you want. The only reason people will probably stay away from it is the fact that it costs more to articulate study models in a lab. Um, if you're doing one crown and you can get an accurate record with just silicone bite registration, you're fine. But if it's more than one crown, if it's veneers, if it's, say it's four to four veneers or two or anterior veneers or a couple of crowns, like you need a, you need a face bow. The, the realistic side of it is the fact that if, you, if you're doing a lot of stuff on a patient, especially undergraduate work, you need very good study models because the chance of you doing more than one thing is quite high in a patient. So, the, so having a face bow is very beneficial and it doesn't take long as well. Um, I've got a, what is a silicone backboard? Um, right. Let me get the picture up. Okay, so this is, it's a method of building up any anterior composite tooth. So if you had a worn tooth, you then get a wax up, you then get like um, intraoral heavy body silicone, mix it up and press it against the palatal surface of the teeth. And then if you look at the bottom right picture, you then have the indentations of the palatal surfaces. You then seat that on your worn dentition. So you then seat that behind these teeth. I look at the bottom picture, and then you'll be able to see where you need to add composite. So you then add composite just beyond the point of the tooth and cure it, and you'd have a little bit of like a composite shelf. And then all you do is fill it in and bond it to the tooth. Yeah, that's great. That before and after picture is incredible. You did such a good job. It could be the pictures as well. But. <laughs> Can you use that um, silicon backboard on anterior and posterior teeth? Yeah, so, sorry. I did it on the anterior as well. So the anterior teeth, any anterior composite work is the hardest one you'll do because I do a mylar strip pull through technique. So when I put the silicone backboard against the tooth, I then put a mylar strip between it as well, pull the mylar strip round, and then you can do your sides of your teeth. When you're messing with lower anterior teeth that are like seven millimeters probably in diameter, it's really quite tight and fiddly, but you definitely can do, and it's, it's one of the most predictable ways of doing it. You see a lot of people do it with um, a blow down splint and then just squirt composite in and seat it, but you get so much excess and you just end up sticking every tooth together. So definitely, even though this is more technique sensitive, the more you practice this at dental school, even on your study models in like skills, this is a way that it might take more time to start with, but it means you're not getting like a fine needle burn section all through the teeth because you've got section teeth already. And also the contacts for these are very nice. You can always floss through them. There's nice contacts. You're not going to be having to drill through all your contacts. Thank you. There was one more question as well, Nigel, I think. Okay. Um, okay, start. Oh, am I going to sound like I'm... Um, so I've read about, not me personally, but some, I've read about the op, me op, le op. <laughs> sorry if I said the wrong, in regards to occlusion, but I don't really understand it. Read what, sorry? Um, yeah, it's, it's just, can you see it on the thing? I've Emma asked it. Apparently that's how I meant to say it. T-H-I-O-P, M-I-O-P, L-I-O-P. But yeah. Thanks, Emma. No I, I don't know what that is, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, Thop and Sioko CR. Um, does she want to break down what Thiop means? Like, I, I they literally, like, from what I've discussed, is all you really need to know. But um, the answer to that would be I don't know. Um, any specific I was recommend. So, for Emma's question, I don't know what she's on about, but um, for Nikita, literally just read no i haven't you i if you read if there's stuff that you don't know and it's confusing you ignore it totally ignore that and the there's a series of papers by stephen davis called occlusion ones what is occlusion what is simple direct simple indirect complex ortho implants 
is about seven um, papers. You only really need to know the first three or four. I'd read what is occlusion, simple occlusion, and then or the, or the reorganized approach and the organized, and then the conformative is the only one to really need. And then even the, conf uh, even, sorry, the, even the reorganized approach goes into a lot more detail of stuff that I've kept out of this today just to keep it simple. But read those papers, I definitely have to say that. And then uh, it won't click straight away, but hopefully you'll be able to understand some of the things I've said in regards to the papers as well. I think, are you happy for people to, either if you um, send us these papers or if they can DM you on Instagram? If you yeah, um, I've I, I got, I'm not on the computer, but I've got them on, my, on an iPad, so I'll be able to find them, yeah. Also, if you literally search Stephen Davies, occlusion, then nature, I don't know why nature, but they come up on Google, but I'll, I'll, I'll find them. Drop me like a DM on Instagram or something and I'll, I'll sort it out. Perfect, okay. Um, any and any, any other questions, if anyone wants to ask, if they don't want to ask them here, drop me a message and I'll answer them. I've got one more question. Um, you said you tried the injection moulding technique. What did, why did you decide against this? So, I, I, well, I was watching loads of stuff on it, but oh, this would be really good to do it. So, I got, so you need Memosil for a start and restorative clinics and student clinics, most of them don't have it. So I had to get it from post-grad clinic. It's a clear silicone and you can then like cure through it. The problem with it as well is that it's not that sturdy, so you don't get massively good adaption. Okay. Secondly, you need some kind of heated composite. Heated composite doesn't work great, like especially with the stuff we've got, you end up with voids. You can't use flowable composite because the amount of filler material in flowable composite is over half. And the fact that the filler material is over half means that, especially in toothwear cases, they'll just wear. If it's like an occlusal veneer, say it's a completely cosmetic case and you just want some composite veneers, then that's fine to use flowable because you've got labial surfaces. However, in the dental school, we didn't have any flowable bulk fill composite with high filler particles. So then we, I, I just decided to use against it. And to be honest, I'd never done it and I'd done composite build up some patients and friends with a silicone backboard technique before and uh, I know how to use it. So you just got to work with what you know is best. Um, one more. Um, because you have worn teeth. Take the light away from it because the light makes it look like it's white. Okay. Um, <laughs> because you have worn teeth, what are you taking the silicone backboard yeah, off? So the silicone backboard, you're taking the impression of the wax up. Yeah. And um, yeah, anyone got any last minute questions? I think we've gone through.